A reading from the Gospel according to Matthew, chapter 17. Six days later, Jesus took with him Peter and James and his brother John and led them up a high mountain by themselves. And he was transfigured before them, and his face shone like the sun, and his clothes became bright as light. Suddenly there appeared to them Moses and Elijah talking with him. Then Peter said to Jesus, Lord, it is good for us to be here. If you wish, I will set up three tents here, one for you, one for Moses, and one for Elijah. While he was still speaking, suddenly a bright cloud overshadowed them, and a voice from the cloud said, This is my son, the beloved. With him I am well pleased. Listen to him. When the disciples heard this, they fell to the ground and were overcome by fear. But Jesus came and touched them and saying, Get up and do not be afraid. And when they raised their eyes, they saw no one except Jesus himself alone. I would like to invite the children who are here to come down and join me in the front pew for a few minutes. Hi. Hey, where's your shoes? You can sit over here. Got all this stuff. Lots of stuff. Did you wear boots today? Is that why you don't have shoes on? Or is it just because, you know, you like having no shoes? Yeah, me too. Me too. Do you remember last Sunday I told you that I had a surprise for Warren? Do you remember that? No, vaguely, huh? Didn't really make an impact. Well, I did surprise him with a trip. Hey, here comes Kitty. Hi. Hi, hi, hi. Come on down. So last week, on Valentine's Day, I, hi, hi, nice to meet you. Yeah. We went to Chicago. He didn't know we were going to Chicago. He thought we were going to go to Bayfield. Oh, <laughs> Bayfield's pretty and all that, but no, we went to Chicago. And we did two things in Chicago. One thing, yeah, I know, it's so cool when you can see yourself. It's just really for fun. In Chicago, we went to a conservatory of spring flowers. I know, we're not going to see spring flowers up here for a while. But this was like a very big greenhouse, so we could see lots of spring flowers. But the other thing we did is we went to a magic show. Have you ever seen magic? Have you ever seen anybody perform magic? No? No? Have you ever seen a magic trick? <clears throat> I'm not going to do one because I can't. I am not good at magic. But it was such amazing things that people did. And it kind of reminded me of this story that we just heard about Jesus. It seemed like a magic trick, that he glowed with light, and his disciples couldn't believe it. What on earth is he doing? So do you see this picture on the front of the bulletin? It was like Jesus was that bright, bright light and they just didn't know they didn't know what to think of it so they said oh this is good this is good we're going to build a box and we're going to contain this light in this box would that work <laughs> no that wouldn't work you wouldn't be able to keep light in a box and Jesus said to them, don't be afraid. There's nothing to be afraid of. 
But later, he also said, you can't hide your light under a bushel basket or in a box. It seemed like magic, but it was just Jesus, you know, being Jesus. Kind of a strange story, and we're going to learn about it after you go up to Sunday school with, I think, with Clyde and Julie Johnson. They're teaching Sunday school today, but before you go, could we have a prayer together? We thank you, God, that sometimes you are like magic in our lives, a bright light of understanding, even when we don't understand. Thank you for all of your miracles, especially all of those that Jesus taught us. Amen. Tell me your name. Do you have a name? What is it? You trying to remember? What's your name? Hector. Oh, Hector. Okay. Well, the, Hunter. oh, Hunter. I'm so sorry. I didn't hear it. So these two will be with you in Sunday school. And you see back there? That's Mr. Johnson. So if you go this way, the, the Sunday school room is upstairs in the sun room, and there's lots of good stuff to do up there. So you want to head up there now, right up that aisle. Have fun.
December 21st was the winter solstice, the day with the fewest hours of light. This past December 21st, when we worshiped together for the service of the longest night, it was especially cold, windy, and icy, so we definitely felt the dark. In this northern hemisphere where we are accustomed to the many hours of darkness in December and January, one of the traditions we honor religiously is the lighting of candles, one and then two each week to offset the darkness until we get to four, the season of Advent. It's a way to use increasing light to prepare ourselves for the birth of the one who brings light. After December 21st, the days begin to grow longer again. The increased minutes of sunlight mark the turn of the earth towards spring. So it might be said that immediately following December 21st, I mean like the very next day, Spring is on the way. It's a way to use light to trick ourselves through these really long hours of darkness. I need every one of these tricks of light. I think I like making candles precisely because I need light in the darkness. It's a kind of reframing looking at what is dark and setting it into another context, which often has the effect of changing the thing altogether. So for example, candle light has a particular beauty in the dark that it doesn't have in the light of day. It's a metaphorical way to think differently about something, interpreting it in a new way. If you say that something is a trick of the light, you mean that what you are seeing is an effect caused by the way that the light falls on things and does not really exist in the way that it appears. Today is Transfiguration Sunday, the last Sunday before Lent begins. Though I imagine that all of your Christmas decorations have long since been put away, today is actually the end of the Christmas Epiphany season. Mary and Joseph are off in Egypt. The Magi have tricked Herod. Matthew's Christian story has shifted now to Jesus as an adult, and we are about to enter the wilderness with him. But first, we hear this really strange story, the closing bookend to a long metaphorical season that began back in November, setting the stage for Jesus as an adult. Remember all of those allusions to light in the darkness? A light shines in the darkness and the darkness has not overcome it. A star guided three kings to the birthplace of a new king, the one who replaced Herod. We lit candles during Advent and on the longest night <clears throat> and again on Christmas Eve. And today we hear the story of how Jesus himself now is the light. The transfiguration story was first recorded in Mark's gospel, but then it was retold by Matthew and Luke. A moment in the lives of Peter and James and John that scared them, stirred them, caused them to blurt out misunderstanding words and to ponder again, who is this Jesus? And what on earth had just happened 
to him. Then it made them silent and afraid. It was an occasion the three Gospels, Mark, Luke, and Matthew, tell us that marked a significant moment in Jesus' ministry. It placed him in the company with Moses and Elijah. It reiterated his identification as uniquely chosen by God, a repeat of the experience of his baptism at the hands of John. The story is miraculous, the way it is told, of course. His clothes turned dazzling bright, his face glowed, reminding us of how Moses also glowed when he encountered God, a glow from which he protected his people because it frightened them. In other words, this story, especially as Matthew told it, is packed to the brim with literary symbolism and meaning. For the disciples who witnessed the transfiguration of Jesus, it was a profoundly reframing moment. This was no longer just that compelling rabbi who called them from their nets to a life of discipleship. This truly was the Messiah, the one who stood in that long line of prophets going back to King David himself. This one would bring Israel back to God the most they could hope for. And discipleship to this Jesus Messiah, if this experience was any indication of it, was going to be baffling and terrifying. English major that I was, from a literary perspective, this transfiguration story holds within it all the meaning of Jesus' life and ministry. His death, his historical place, his transcendence of history. Why were the figures that appeared with Jesus Elijah and Moses? Perhaps because of their close association with the law and prophecy placing Jesus in company with those essential facets of faithful life. Or perhaps it was a hint of the empty tomb. In that, and here you're going to have to just trust me on this, neither Elijah or Moses had final resting places identified in Scripture. The glowing clothes, do they not hint at the appearance of the angels in the tomb in bright raiments? There's the voice from the cloud with words that remind us of Jesus' baptism and that unique relationship between Jesus and God. And the words themselves identify him. This is the one, the beloved, to whom the believer should, you know, Listen, all these signs mark this story as a kind of microcosm containing both the meaning of Jesus' ministry and the cost of his messiahship. No wonder Peter wanted to freeze it, capture the experience in three tabernacles, so it could be taken out and observed again, experienced, pondered over, and embraced. Not understood, but certainly remembered as something transcendent, mystical, unexplainable, and really kind of irrational. In his book, Jesus, A New Vision, New Testament scholar Marcus Borg identified the transfiguration as well as other mystical, spirit-filled stories about Jesus as belonging to the tradition that claimed Jesus as a charismatic, 
someone who drew upon mysticism as the source for his authority and power. Every year when I preach on the Transfiguration, I will refer to Marcus Borg's book because it is the only one that I know of in progressive Christianity that actually tackles this very mysterious event. Marcus Borg argued that Jesus stood in a tradition that is very foreign to us, but one that was well-known and widely respected in the first century, Jewish mysticism. This mystical way of understanding Jesus can be seen in his deeply meditative prayer life and during his sojourn in the wilderness. Jesus appeared to have a direct connection to the life of the Spirit, a consistent, seemingly direct communication with heaven itself. His disciples, most notably Peter, did not understand. I'm with Peter. In fact, theological nerd that I am, I had a hard time understanding Marcus Borg's book about Jesus' mysticism, let alone the mysticism itself. But I'll tell you something. When I was very young, I had what I can only describe as a vision of the face of Jesus. Filtered through my young mind, it felt wonderful. Several times in my life, I have known of the death of someone just before I'm actually told it has happened. Once or twice, I have been overcome with an inexplicable sense of peace in the middle of a truly dangerous situation. A couple times, I've been able to summon the courage to speak, to actually preach when my heart was breaking, more than once, and to the very people responsible for breaking my heart. What kind of moments are those? Can they be explained rationally? It's a little even embarrassing to confess them to you since they seem sort of woo woo woo. But those are times, I think, when the Holy Spirit, that enigmatic and elusive energy, has been at work. I don't know, and actually I don't feel any need to explain those experiences or even to define them, because the experiences themselves were not as important as what came next. And then next, and then next after that. That's what I think is so powerful about this transfiguration story. The experience itself, whether the disciples understood it or not, whether it was simply an embroidered literary technique to give Jesus more moral authority, or whether it was just a trick of the light, or an example of a kind of spiritualism common in the first century. None of those things make a difference to getting through the day. Rather, I am helped, genuinely lifted, if not armored, by what came after the Transfiguration experience. Hear these words again from Matthew. The disciples fell to the ground and were overcome with fear. But Jesus came and touched them and said, Get up. Do not be afraid. Maybe this part of the story helps you as it has me. 
when I am afraid, when the powers of greed and violence and hate threaten to overcome me until I practically fall to the ground, unable to read yet another news report, yet another story of a mass shooting, or listen to another debate, or see another photo of a child alone standing in the rubble of what was once her home, catch another whiff of a lie, watch the behavior of some of our leaders that we wouldn't tolerate in a fifth grader, listen to the spurious interpretation of the Second Amendment as a justification for carrying an assault weapon onto a college campus when I just cannot stand another moment and I fall to the metaphorical ground in despair. Jesus touches me and tells me to get up and do not be afraid. It may be true that Jesus himself relied upon the spiritualist tradition of first century Judaism to relay his message to the world. That is a strand of theology that I will never understand. His biographers believed it and so I will try. But the miracles like this, this transfiguration, this glow from Jesus, those are not the things that get me out of bed in the morning. The dazzling light from Jesus' face doesn't touch my heart particularly. No, for me, the words that give me a light in the darkness are these. Get up. Do not be afraid. Do not be afraid. Amen. Please be seated.
Though I can't possibly know all of the prayer concerns that are on your heart, still I am offering this prayer on your behalf and hope that I capture some sense of what you might need of God's presence. Let us pray. O oh God of wonder and God of miraculous vision, the stories of your presence are so amazing and so unlike our own daily experiences. And yet, from these stories, we learn that you are with us. You are light itself. You begin the Jesus story with light. And you now give us light to prepare for the discipleship of these Lenten days ahead. We thank you for the witness to your light of the gospel writers who heard the stories about Jesus, though they did not know him themselves, but interpreted them in such a way that gave them life, a life that continues even today. We thank you for all of the metaphors and symbols, all of the ways that we are invited into those stories, not because they are factual, but because they are true. Help us, O oh God, to interpret faithfully, to be inspired, to internalize these stories so that our lives also might be filled with courage and strength that we too might be touched and told to not be afraid, to stand, to work, to love, to receive and care and honor all human life, to protect this fragile earth, to inspire others, with our quiet dignity and generous giving. We stand, too, in that long tradition of discipleship, seeking understanding, learning how to live faithfully, offering ourselves as your servants. We pray this day, O oh God, for all of those individuals that we hold in our hearts, people who are in physical pain, people facing surgery, people in the process of toxic but hopefully life-giving chemotherapy, people who are wondering if life has lost its meaning, people who are preparing with joy for good things to come, people who face this long afternoon afraid to be alone. Hear our prayers, we humbly ask. You who receive all of those into your own huge heart, receive our little lives. These things we ask, and for whatever might be best for us and for all you love. As we say together the prayer, 
that Jesus taught his disciples, saying, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread. Forgive us our sins as we forgive those who sin against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, the power, and the glory forever. Amen. Now as we give our gifts for the work of this church, may our hearts be open and generous so that all that we are able to give and those who receive our gifts might be made strong and whole in our service to our Savior Christ. Our ushers will now receive the morning offering. Let us pray together. O oh God, most generous and kind, we thank you for the hope our faith brings to us. May we be generous in turn for the sake of your people here and everywhere. We dedicate these gifts and our lives to your service. Amen.
Beloved, now may God's grace, love, compassion, and hope for all of us surround us with life and light wherever we go. Amen. Thank you.